Hello, friends, and welcome to our webinar tonight. On behalf of Q Christian Fellowship, I am delighted you're here. My name is Nathaniel Green. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I serve on staff at QCF as communications director. And I've been here for three and a half-ish years, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, thank you for joining us. Tonight's whole theme is built on our, our pride theme, uh, Life Abundant. And tonight we're talking about specifically uh, what it's like to have pride as LGBTQ plus Christians. And so I hope as you get tuned in that you get comfortable, you relax, you have fun. Um, if you're new to these conversations about LGBTQ plus identity and faith in particular, um, I hope that you'll, you'll stay focused and just kind of listen to what we have to say. A lot of this is just going to be us talking about our experiences, our background with pride and faith, and what that means for us. Um, and so briefly, just to touch on it, uh, pride has a fascinating history. Um, the Stonewall riots uh, took place in June, late June of 1969, uh, after police raided the Stonewall Inn, a gay club in Greenwich Village, New York. Um, in particular, as you might have heard before, uh, trans women of color were at the forefront of this movement. And it was only a year later that the very first, uh, what would become pride marches began popping up um, in LA, Chicago, New York, um, after the riots. And so pride was started in an act of resistance and an act of uh, courage on the part of those who uh, were sick of being marginalized and harassed and oppressed. And pride today, in many ways, is meant to both embody that spirit and that attitude, but also to celebrate what it means to be queer, to be LGBTQ+, what it means to live an abundant life. Um, and so tonight, we're just going to talk a bit about that. What does it mean for us? How do we engage with pride? And so I want to throw it to uh, August, my colleague and friend, and they're going to introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is August and my pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And I live in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I've been with QCF for a little over two years now and I serve as the program director. What that means is I kind of have my hands in all the things that we do that you might engage in as a part of the community. So community groups, which are our virtual small groups, conference, which is our annual get together, parent events, um, developing guides and content, and working with our resource translation teams and many, many more things. We have 14 programming areas that we focus on at QCF. And so I have the honor and privilege of getting to kind of help navigate all of those things as we develop content and continue to curate belonging and radical acceptance for LGBTQ plus Christians, their family members and allies. Erica. Hi everyone, um, I'm Erica and I am one of the people that work and do communications work for QCF. So as a communications focused person, I do a lot of copywriting and writing the emails and writing some of the content that goes out, doing a lot of editing and a little bit of development work. So helping to fund this work that we do. Um, I live in Texas, and I am so excited to be here tonight and ready to, to chat with my, my friends and talk about what pride means to us as LGBTQ Christians. Thank you both. Um, I forgot to say I live in Nashville. We got, Na we got Tennessee and Texas represented tonight. Um, so the first question I want to present to uh, each of us is, what was your first Pride experience like? And so August, would you mind going first? Yeah. So I was reflecting on this because um, I feel like I had like many blips of like Pride experiences, not during Pride Month, but my very first ever Pride experience was when I was in Madison, Wisconsin in the summer of 2017. I was doing a ministry internship with a non-affirming ministry, but I was uh, transitioning from living in Lynchburg, Virginia, attending Liberty University, and I was about to move to Northern California to do an internship and finish my program living with my family. So Madison was kind of like my in-between space, a much more progressive city than Lynchburg, much bigger. Um, and even though I was working for a non-affirming ministry, I was working in the Madison community day in and day out. Um, so one Saturday, 
a few of us decided to go down to the farmer's market. They have it like every weekend at the Capitol. It's this huge, amazing farmer's market. And it happened to be Pride because we were there in the summertime. It was June. It was their Pride celebration Saturday. Um, and I remember just like being exhilarated by the amount of color and the depth of like diversity that was being represented um, at that farmer's market slash street festival that day. Um, I was in the process internally of becoming affirming of the LGBTQ plus community from a faith based from a Christian perspective, but I was still not out. I was still pretty deeply repressed and I was not affirming of myself yet, even though I was becoming affirming of other folks in the community. Uh, and so I just remember like walking around that farmer's market being like, face to face, literally with all of these beautiful people who were expressing themselves and sharing about their identities. Um, and there was a specific table, I think it was probably like a P flag table with lots of smiling faces, like grandma, grandpa aged folks with their mama bear hugs, t-shirts on. And they had these little tiny uh, rainbow ribbons on a, on a clothespin. And they were explaining, oh, the, the safety pin, basically, I think is what it's called, um, is like a representation that you're a safe person for the LGBTQ plus community. And it had this little tiny rainbow ribbon on it. Um, and I remember how much courage matched with fear I felt when I stepped up to that table to like very subtly grab one of those little tiny ribbon pins and tucked it in my bag because I wasn't sure how my teammates would feel about the fact that I was engaging at all in this pride festival. Um, but it reminds me of how much courage I've always had, how brave I've always been even before I was out. And it carries me and like makes me feel brave and courageous today. It's a little pin, little token that I still have. Um, it, it helps me to remember to stand for those things that are beautiful and good and right. And that is acknowledging the belovedness and wholeness of all of God's children. And so that summer in Madison, Wisconsin was really transformative for me in a lot of ways, getting to build relationships with LGBTQ plus folks by and large across the whole summer, but especially that Pride Saturday and stepping up to that table to get that little pin. Okay, so for me, I actually think the first Pride event that I went to was in my hometown in 2019 in the summer. So in my hometown in Indiana, we have a like first Fridays, which is a Friday evening where people hang out around the arts district and there's vendors and there's people with food trucks and just all types of people hanging out and selling things and just being social. And so for the month of June that year, it was like also a little like pride parade thing. So there was lots of local vendors that were like specifically giving out like rainbow and all types of different LGBTQ just merchandise and whatnot. And so it was the first time that I really went to a place where the whole point was to be proud of being a queer person. And so it was really cool. I was just kind of wandering around with my with my family, with the with the kiddos of my family, and we're just like, you know, looking at stuff and just having a really good time. And it was just a really nice kind of it was a moment that I remember thinking like this is what the future looks like. This is it's totally normal. You've got a bunch of kids, you've got everybody hanging out with their families, and it was just a really, really nice event. Um, I think before that the fall of 2018, I went to an event for queer Christians. And I think that was the first time that it was really like, I was in a space that felt very much like a pride festival. Like it felt like this place where, you know, there were so many queer people that were just like me, that were Christians and were dedicated to learning more about Jesus and and what he said and what he didn't say. And I think that is like what I think of as like my first like, Pride moment, but I think the first Fridays was the first like official. This is for Pride. This is June. Um, I think that was the first event. 
I love that. I'm in, I'm enjoying like really like different specific experiences you both had. Um, my first pride. Uh, so August and I went to the same college together, uh, for better or worse. Um, we were both students at Liberty University together. <laughs> uh, so my very first pride was um, in June of 2017. I was uh, three months, two months into my relationship uh, with my now husband, Elliot. And um, I was only, I'd only started coming out um, privately up until that point um, to some close friends and family. Uh, people who were close to me in person knew that. And it wasn't really until uh, like within a month or two of my first product experience that I felt like the ability to finally publicly acknowledge who I was and what I was experiencing. And so um, this was my first time really being able to be in a space that was fully LGBTQ plus. It was fully, um, there was just, there were people everywhere that made me feel like I was seeing other people that were familiar to me that uh, could share in some of my experiences and my story and it was kind of overwhelming to be honest I'm, I'm the kind of person that if i am trying to um if, if something like major happens to me it takes me a long time to process the significance of that like i will not know how i feel about something for a week um, because i have to figure out how i should feel about it and then how i actually feel about it <laughs> so the, that's how i'm always balancing things but pride was it was overwhelming because um my first pride was in washington dc so it was capital pride and it was about three and a half hours away from lynchburg virginia where i went to school and um so elliot and i rode up in his car we parked somewhere and it was first off i mean dc on its own it's a little overwhelming for me i come from a really small town um but it was a whole new thing and i was so excited um and we were, we get going and I, I was just like wow there are vendors there's drag queens there are people wearing clothes i've never seen before there are people uh doing things and expressing themselves i've never seen before and it was kind of like when you see a famous person and you're like, whoa, they're real. Um, and that's what it felt like for me because I was seeing all of these LGBTQ plus people in person in a safe and open way. And I was just not allowed to experience that at my college. And so my first pride was like, it, it felt like drinking from a fire hose. It was just overwhelming, so much happening. And I was like, wow. Um, I remember the, the march in particular really impacted me because as it was happening, you know, I, I can't really describe where it was happening because I don't know DC that well. Um, come to our conference in January and you'll learn a lot about DC. Um, but I didn't really know too much about uh, how DC was laid out. But I remember the march really hit me because, you know, it was 2017, a lot was going on. Um, and I remember being kind of at a corner and looking down, the march was heading towards the White House. And that was just a moment of real significance, especially as a student at Liberty at that time. And um, it all kind of really it had an impact on me. And um, I will say, um, besides the march itself, the most memorable thing uh, was also like one of the most embarrassing experiences of my life. Um, we were, Elliot and I were walking along the sidewalk and there were a bunch of vendors to our right and I was um, thinking he was next to me. And so I reach out and I grab a hand and start to hold it. And it's like immediately like, you know, pulls away and I look up and it's this random man I do not know. Um, and so my first pride included grabbing a man's hand thinking it was Elliot's and it simply was not. Um, which, you know, it was, it took me a few minutes to calm down from that, but it definitely made for a, a memorable weekend. Um, but yeah, I, I really loved I, I loved it. Like I said, it took me a while to really fully process how much that whole experience meant to me and how timely it was in its context. And so uh, I'll, I'll bring us to our next question. Um, what does pride mean to you now? And Erica, I'm going to throw it to you. Yeah. So when I think of pride, like capital P pride, I think that it's a celebration of where we are now. And it's also a time to remember and reflect and thank the people that came before us. Um, I think this is this is a month in particular where I just, I look back and I'm just like, man, if all of these people weren't doing their part to advance civil rights and just fair thought and loving thought for, all people, then I don't really know 
where we would be. I was I was in college, I think. Yeah, I was like I was in college before I realized that I was queer at all, but I was already affirming of LGBT people because I had like this moment of like, I don't think that queer people are just like choosing to be, you know, a, a minority population that, you know, don't, they don't have rights and they're harassed and whatnot. And it was a very much like an outsider kind of looking in. I was just like, that doesn't really make any sense. And if I believe that God makes all of his children to be exactly who they are, then I, I have to affirm people. I have to affirm these people and believe that that's exactly who they're supposed to be. And so I'm just, I'm glad in the month of like, in the month of pride that there were so many people that were yelling and doing all that they had to do to kind of affirm who they were. So that by the time I came around and kind of opened my eyes, I was like, yeah, you're right. I, you definitely deserve all of the rights and the freedoms that, that you want. And it was completely okay for me to be who I am because they came before me and did all the hard work. And there's still plenty of hard work to be done, but we wouldn't be where we are right now if it wasn't for all those people that came before us. So that's what pride means to me. It's this celebration of where we are and where we're going to go and celebrating everyone that came before us. Yeah, I remember, um, in retrospect, I think about how so much of my initial experience of pride was wrapped in kind of, um, like, like resistance and, um, and I mean that like resistance to, uh, institutions or systems that were, um, harming me or excluding me or trying to kind of suppress who I was. And it was hard for me to experience pride as a celebration, like an unbridled joy. Um, and what I've learned, the, the further away I get from college and the more I live kind of out who I am in my own life, you know, I've learned that, you know, that, that kind of joy, that queer joy is really powerful. Um, it's really important. And it can really make a difference, um, not just for ourselves, like it makes a difference for us, but it also makes a difference for the people who are coming after us and the people, you know, the young queer kids who are still asking really fundamental questions about who they are and how they experience life and love and gender. Um, and they're still navigating that. And there are going to be kids who are in that state. They're, they're there now. They're going to be potentially coming to a QCF event or a webinar like this, or they might be uh, finding our stuff on social media. They might be finding a church or a pastor or a network that connects them to an affirming space. And so there was so much for me that pride was initially kind of like that for me, I'm protesting the injustices I've experienced in the church and in my school and in relationships. And now it's like, how can I experience this as joy? Um, and pride is an opportunity to belong to know that uh, what many have rejected as other or sin is well and truly beloved, um, wholly, completely, unequivocally beloved. And it's community and trust. And while it's never perfect, there are always opportunities to do and be better. And um, I think that's, I see that as kind of a process of sanctification almost, making us more holy. And I think pride is one of those mechanisms of sanctification for the world um, to make us more just, more equitable, more holy. Um, and I think pride is, especially just tying it back to that theme of life abundant, I think pride is like a concentrated experience of abundant, holy, good life. And um, experiencing it as that, both holding intention that it's it's an act of protest, it's a, it's a calling, proclaiming for rights and equality, but it's also a celebration. And as it was, you know, 40 years ago, 45, 50 years ago, um, it can be for us today. And there's progress that's been made, but there's still so much work to do. And so pride for me right now is an experience of joy, an experience of what's possible. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. So I'm gonna throw it to you, August. Yeah. I love that concept of like imperfect and yet ever present community. And I think that's a great representation of like what we try to cultivate at QCF and what we aspire to see like at large for LGBTQ plus folks and 
uh, all of God's children, honestly, of like having that sense of presence and um, belonging, even and especially when it's imperfect because we are people. Um, I think for me, I was just talking about this with my therapist the other day. Part of what pride means to me now is acknowledging and celebrating and noticing how far I've come. Um, being raised in like a pretty conservative thread of Christianity and then going to the mega evangelical Christian university um, and being like going through so much, especially in college in particular. Um, I think being able to look back at like, where was I when I was growing up and didn't necessarily hear explicitly negative things about queer people from my family, but there was a lot that was tolerated and excused and overlooked by my parents that constructed an image for me of how they would respond if I ever came out to them. Um, and back when I was in the kinds of churches and back when I was in college where there would be people that would take any opportunity to pivot the sermon to somehow make it about how homosexuality was a sin and was wrong and was against the Bible and was against God. And just that constant messaging about how I was inherently broken and there was something wrong with me because of my sexual orientation and my gender identity. But looking and seeing now, like being, I joke that I'm a professional queer person, <laughs> getting to work with QCF and like getting to be a minister in this space. Um, it's just like such a vast spectrum from where I was even just a few years ago and like celebrating the wholeness that has come about through finding my community and through finding affirmation and belonging. Um, I think especially like as a survivor of conversion therapy, I think about like liberation being a part of what pride means to me um, and peace, knowing that like I'm not broken. There's nothing in me that needs to be fixed or uprooted or any of those metaphors that people will so often use to like spiritualize abuse. Um, that there's nothing wrong with me, but I deserve to be not just represented, but known. I deserve to be seen and be safe and whole. Um, and it's a thing that every human being deserves. And too much we have to fight for it. Like both of you mentioned, there's still so much work to be done. But we can continue to make proclamations about how we deserve these rights to exist in peace and liberation and invisibility and being known and being accepted and embraced uh, without hiding and without feeling broken. And I hope that for all of us, we can see pride as an opportunity to reflect and, and look at how far we have come personally in our journey, as long as, as well as big picture, alongside big picture of like how far we've come as a community and especially. Uh, as a community of LGBTQ plus Christians. Thank you for sharing that. You you prompted a question I kind of wanted to just kind of toss out there. Um, would either of you be willing to kind of share just a little bit about what or how you were able to arrive at a place of affirmation for yourself? Um, maybe what helped you? Uh, were there resources? Was there an experience? Was there people, spaces? Just kind of curious for those who are listening who might still be kind of in that process, what that might have been like for you. Either one of you, you can jump in, go right ahead. I can go. So I kind of touched on this briefly, but my process of becoming affirming was exactly what I said. It was like, it was this, this moment of clarity in which I was like, I just don't think that queer people are choosing to be persecuted. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a black woman and I love being a black woman, but with that comes a lot of negativity just, just in, my, in my regular everyday existence. Like there's misogyny, there's racism, there's this special bland, there's just like a special blend of like misogynistic racism that black women have to deal with. And so I'm, you know, thinking and reflecting on the fact that apparently 
gay people are choosing to be persecuted. They're choosing to not have rights, to have like their just basic existence be illegal in a lot of places. And it just didn't make any sense. It just made absolutely no sense to me. And so once I realized that that's just how people are, people are just born that way, it was a really easy step for me to be like, well, if that's how God made them, then it's all good. Like whatever, you know, however God creates a person to be, you know, as long as they're moving forward in their life with love in their hearts, then it's, it's good. And so for me, it was just that kind of like rationalization that that was the only thing that made any sense. And then from there, I was like, does anyone else feel this way? Because I can't be the only one. And then it was finding like the Gay Christian Network, as it was called back when I was on the forums, kind of poking around, trying to see what everyone else was saying. And I was like, yeah, this makes way more sense. It makes way more sense that there's a lot of mistranslation going on in the Bible that we know today. There's a lot of just bad interpretations of what's happening. Um, A lot of people saying that Jesus said this and he actually said nothing about it at all. Like there's just a lot of confusion happening. And that's where I was like, yeah, okay. I definitely, I got to just, I got to support the gays. I got to be an ally. I just have to, because that's just what makes sense. And I've always been someone that if I'm presented with information about how someone else reacts and or someone or how someone else believes Christianity to, to be, I'm pretty open to kind of thinking about it and saying, how do I feel, you know, whatever. And, and yeah, I'm pretty open to different ideas and different concepts. So it was kind of, you know, just right time, right, right place for my brain to put it together and realize that affirming Christianity is the only Christian Christianity that I'm interested in. Yeah. I think that that's so helpful. Like it's kind of a blend. And for me, it was similar. It wasn't like any one thing, I guess. Um, I will say like relationship was a huge aspect of what helped me move from being non-affirming and in a way that I was kind of just going through the motions and completely unaware of how embedded homophobia and transphobia and queerphobia were in the Christianity that I was raised with and especially the Christianity that was being espoused where I went to college. Um, The relationship with LGBTQ plus people really drew something out of me because it it was this human element. It was no longer just a behavior or a lifestyle choice that we were talking about in general or in the abstract. Um, It was someone living, breathing, sitting in front of me who I cared about, who I had a relationship with. And I wanna be clear, like I know it's not the job of LGBTQ plus people to educate other people um, about why it's okay, valid, and um, you know, why they belong within the fold of God, like it's not their responsibility. And so I wanna like shout out those people in my life who I won't name for the sake of like their (laughs) privacy and not embarrassing them. But um, those people who sat with me and had difficult conversations and like not even necessarily people who were affirming, but people who were LGBTQ plus and Christian. Um, willing to parse out some of like, what does the Bible say in the way that we translate it? What does that mean? How does that feel? How does it feel to think about living a life as a celibate person? How does it feel to think about having to be choosing between loving someone and living in your faith? Like learning about the human emotion through those relationships was really like groundbreaking for me. And then I'm kind of a nerd. I did end up going to seminary. And so before I started seminary, a couple of years before I started digging into the original Greek and learning what I could just from Google and reading scholarly articles about the mistranslation of these passages that we call the clopper passages, those passages that are used against LGBTQ plus folks saying that they can't be affirmed in the eyes of God or scripture. Um, And my whole, perspective on scripture really shifted at that point too from learning about the translation process and socio-historical context around scripture and so 
it kind of busted things wide open for me to be able to say like these arguments that I was taught about people's belovedness not being valid because of a way that they're oriented or because biology made a blip and they are not uh, the gender that they were assigned at birth after all like you know these things it, it can be i can be more open-minded and still have a faith and still believe in god and still follow jesus um so i definitely think that like it's a process it was not an overnight thing and that was just the process of me becoming affirming for other people like i won't even get into <laughs> the deep internal struggle and process that it was beyond getting over the intellectual hurdles of scripture and making those relationships to become affirming for myself and to be, become comfortable and, and have a sense of security that I could be an LGBTQ plus person and be a Christian um, and having to overcome a lot of internalized homophobia and transphobia in that process. Yeah, thank you both for sharing, kind of a, a throwing that question in the mix. Um, it's always really moving and powerful to hear um, how other people arrive um, where they do. And, you know, hopefully we can, you know, see in the world the kind of belonging that means that nobody has to even go on that journey, that it's just assumed that LGBTQ plus people are valid and beloved. And part of our work here as an organization is to help the church live up to that call um, of radical belonging. And so there's clearly so much to do. And our hope is that over time, you know, for less and less people will have to go through that process, that they'll be able to just start off assuming that who they are, who they love, how they experience life, gender, sexuality um, is affirmed. And that their faith is not at odds, but their faith is rather, you know, key to, to them really celebrating who they are. So thank you both for sharing that. That was really moving. Um, I'm going to kind of bring it to our next question. Um, what does it mean to have pride as LGBTQ plus Christians? I know that's a really broad and open question. But I'm curious to see how either of you interpret it. So um, August, I'll toss it back to you. Yeah. Uh, what does it mean to have pride as an LGBTQ plus Christian? I think that um some of it is coming from a theological place like if you have a fundamental belief that god is good and you believe that all that god has created is good like in genesis in the creation narrative god says it's good god creates humans god says they are very good if you believe god is good and god's creation is good then there's a fundamental goodness within you as well that's the logical next step to those theological convictions. So seeing myself as God's very good creation, like the psalmist says in Psalm 139, fearfully and wonderfully created. Um, seeing myself like theologically as a piece, a little sliver, a minute portion of the goodness and divinity of God alive and embodied in um in this world living incarnate um i think that like having pride as an lgbtq plus christian and especially with the christian part which is why i'm kind of going a little theological for this is to really like own and live into our belovedness because if we believe that god is good and we believe god's creation is good but then we turn and look at ourselves in the mirror and we believe these lies that a lot of religious voices will tell you that you are inherently broken and bad and sinful then what does that say about how deeply you truly believe in the goodness of god and the, in the goodness of god's creation uh, i think that we deserve to be proud of ourselves we deserve to be proud to acknowledge the truth that we are god's very good creation made fearfully and wonderfully made beloved woven together in the womb and you know that doesn't mean we're perfect <laughs> it doesn't mean that there are no mistakes made in the biological process because i think that like we clearly live in a world where we have like frail bodies and there are failures and 
There are things that we have to cope with as human beings. The goodness doesn't mean that we live in perfection. It just means that we live in goodness. We're not broken. We're not inherently sinful or bad. We can celebrate and revel in the fact that we are God's fearful and wonderfully made creation. Um, and I think that a lot of what it looks like for me to live into pride or have pride as an LGBTQ plus person and as a Christian is moving from this like fear-based mindset of scarcity that would say that I am bad and I'm broken and I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, um, and there's nothing good that I can ever do on my own. That's like a very fear-based and scarcity-based mindset. Moving from that into a mindset of enoughness and even abundance, abundant life, abundant peace, abundant hope, and abundant community. And that's like our aspiration for all the folks that engage in QCF is that they experience this abundant life and particularly abundant sense of belonging and belovedness and community. Um, and so having pride, being a Christian, being LGBTQ+, from a theological standpoint, I think a lot of it is about claiming our goodness to like simplify it. If you take nothing else away from that whole like maybe seminarian rant that I just gave, just hear that you are inherently good. I believe that with every bit of myself that we as humans are a reflection of God's goodness, God's good creation, fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's part of why we have reason to be proud of ourselves. We have reason to be proud of our community. Yes, in these intersecting identities. Yes, even though people would claim that these intersecting identities cannot coexist. Yes, even in a world that's hostile against us, we can still be proud of our goodness and know there's nothing that can take that away from us. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Erica, I'm really curious what your thoughts are now that I've kind of given a little mini rant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what about having pride as an LGBTQ plus Christian? What does that mean for you? Okay, so for me, it is about honoring our creator and being thankful that he made us exactly as we are and being proud to be one of God's diverse and, and beautiful flock. And I think that's what it, that's what it comes down to is like what I'm thinking of, like how I see pride as an LGBTQ Christian. It's very much like, I'm just, I'm proud that I am the person that God made me to be. I think sometimes that I think God was like, you're going to be bisexual so that you can explain to people that your choice to live in your truth in your queerness is something that makes you closer to me because i definitely think that's true like i definitely think that you know the fact that i'm i'm married i have a wife and my wife is non-binary but also in seminary and wants to be like a pastor full time and i support him all the way 100% and it's like the conversations that we have about about God and his goodness and what we want to do for other people like i like i have that with with another queer person and so it's kind of like yeah i could have intentionally just went out and be like i'm just looking for one cis man and that's it um but i just feel like there's too much goodness going on in the world and in my relationship to feel like i shouldn't be proud to be an LGBT person. So that to me is like the big thing about being, you know, having pride as an LGBT Christian. It's like, I am, I'm exactly who God wanted me to be. I am trying to do as Jesus said and to, to love everyone, my neighbors, just as I love myself. I'm always trying to, to figure out how to spread his love and spread his spread his word. And, and yeah, that's, that's kind of what it comes down to is just being proud of, of who I am and being proud to be a creation from God. And yeah, that's what I think. So way less like theological and more like, that's just how my heart feels. I'm very much like my heart says do it. So I'm going to do it. Um, you were, August, you were saying, you were saying something earlier and it reminded me of the fact that 
when I kind of realized like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a queer Christian. There wasn't a lot of like me needing to like affirm myself. I was very much like, listen, like homophobes are not taking Jesus for me. Like I feel him so strongly, like, yeah, no, it's not happening. So it was, it was an immediate affirmation of myself because I was like, I know what I feel for him and I'm going to spend the rest of my life loving Jesus and talking about how good and wonderful and abundant he's made my life. And no one's going to take that away from me. So I have a lot of pride in being exactly who I was created to be. I feel like you're both preaching sermons today. Um, seminary degree or not. Um, I'm not in seminary. Sorry to, to not quite live up to the standard. Just kidding. Um, no, that's so great. Thank you both for sharing. Um, I was thinking a lot about how um, I didn't get to really, I didn't really understand what pride meant until after I really had a reason to understand. At least I realized I had a reason to understand. Um, and I used to be really caught up in the name of pride. Um, you know, and it, this is, it seems maybe silly to some of us, but like, what does pride mean if, if, if not like something sinful or doesn't it connote something bad? Um, so it wasn't really until I interrogated my identity in relation to my faith that I was able to kind of find that new, like, uh, spiritual meaning in pride. And so for me, um, one of my favorite things in the world is the Lord's Prayer. Um, it's probably my favorite prayer that I pray when I'm in church. Um, it's the prayer that I pray when I'm in an airplane taking off because for some reason I still cannot not be stressed in an airplane taking off. Um, but the, the line in it that gets me every time and the line that really feels like the heart of pride to me is on earth as it is in heaven. Um, it just feels like pride feels to me now as an LGBTQ plus Christian, it, to me, it feels like a little bit of that heaven on earth, a little bit of this is the good, this is the belonging that I was craving. And so, so much of pride is wrapped up in that prayerful sort of invocation of God's kingdom in the world, uh, God's family, belonging in the world. Um, and so I'll never, like I said earlier, I'll never forget watching uh, during Capitol Pride that march um, in the direction of the White House and, and how for me as a Liberty student in that moment, who wasn't fully out yet, but was still in process, it was, it was a, a moment where the visibility of pride became really salient, really important um, for me. And so for my faith, uh, experiencing pride is an opportunity to give thanks for who I am as an image bearer of God. Um, for me, having pride is really claiming my identity as God's child. It's claiming that I am really truly beloved and that there's nothing, no one, uh, as Paul says, no power, principality. Uh, there's nothing that can take that away. Um, and as adversarial as the world can sometimes be, and I know that we use the word, the, the terminology, the world as Christians sometimes in ways that are unhelpful, but I really mean that here in as adversarial as those powers and principalities can be, um, pride is a way to really put a stake in the ground and be like, no, I belong here and I will have my joy. And so there's so much to be grateful for. And I, and I, even in those moments of hostility, I, I think back to how important, and I, I'll be the first to say, like, sometimes I wish pride was in October, like, I'm a cardigan gay, like, I could really use, like, a fall time pride march where I'm wearing sweaters and, and, and you know, um, but pride in, in all of its glorious, uh, for us in the States, summertime experience for the, the life and, and vibrancy and sometimes sunshine, sometimes rain, it's just such a beautiful moment of gratitude. I'm really grateful for that. Um, and like I said, it's an opportunity for God's kingdom to come in the world on earth as it is in heaven where future LGBTQ plus kids like my younger self can have a full and rich and beautiful life to not have to even navigate those questions, to not have to experience um, that the friction or the inconsistency between what they might believe and who they are. Um, and so... My hope is that pride can continue to be for me and for other queer Christians, a practice, not just something we celebrate in uh, June, but like an, a year round practice of, 
of gratitude, of belonging, of justice. Um, it's pride is work. Pride is not just a party. Pride is work. And so there, I mean, my whole answer has a number of different things that pride is, I guess, but um, that's kind of where I'm at these days. And so I'm, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for this conversation. Um, I wanted to kind of throw out a question, kind of a prompt before we start wrapping up. Um, and if you have a question, feel free to to leave it in the chat before we go. I would love to be able to get to it. But I wanted to ask either of you, um, is there any ways that allies can support LGBTQ plus Christians, um, not just this pride, but throughout the year? Do you have any kind of tips or pointers for ways that folks who are aspiring to support, empower, encourage, um, uplift their LGBTQ plus siblings in the church can be helpful? Uh, I have many thoughts. Um, <laughs> if you're an ally and um, you attend a non-affirming church or you kind of tolerate and don't say anything to homophobic and transphobic comments by friends, partners, family members, um, if you want to be an ally and you still feel a little bit uncomfy about sharing your pronouns because you're not sure exactly what that means or why it's important. There are some things I like invite you to do. <laughs> um, you know, it's a process, it's a learning curve and allyship is a verb, it's an active uh, method of being. It is not just like a list of ascribed beliefs. And so I encourage you to like, tell your church you're affirming, ask your pastor. If you go to a non-affirming church, ask your pastor about their position on LGBTQ plus folks within the um, sense of Christianity, have conversations. You know, if you decide to stay in a non-affirming church because of any given reason, I understand there's a lot of dynamics there, relationships, investment, family, location, um, you know, at least start those conversations with people in leadership and ask them their perspective. Um, you know, read or study a book together and have a conversation about it. I think that that's not just during Pride, that's any time of the year, all year round. Um, you know, don't tolerate homophobic, transphobic, queerphobic comments from people. If, if someone says something and it, it stings and you're an ally, imagine how it feels for an LGBTQ plus person who might be in the room because you never know whether or not they're out, um, who's overhearing. And even if no one is there to hear it, it's still unjust. It's still not right to allow those kinds of comments to just pass by. Um, so say something, you know, say, oh, can you explain what you mean by that? Because I don't think we're on the same page or like, what do you mean when you say that? Or I don't think that's funny, actually. Like, you know, LGBTQ plus people deserve respect to um, be willing to like take a risk and and share a little bit of yourself and that's what allyship looks like is taking a risk for love in my opinion um, and as far as like pronouns go as someone who uses they them pronouns um, I know that they are not easy to use for everyone I know it's a learning curve I know it's a process um, whether you are a binary trans person or non-binary person, gender queer, whatever pronouns you use, um, as a cisgender person, someone whose gender identity aligns with the sex and gender they were assigned at birth and socialized as a cisgender person um, who wants to be an ally, it's part of your role to get more comfortable with introducing yourself with your pronouns to practice using the correct pronouns for people in your life, um, especially if you know someone who started going by different pronouns than the pronouns they used when you first met them. It's also part of your role to like not assume people's pronouns and practice using they them pronouns for people whose pronouns you don't know. Um, those are a couple of like concrete examples that come to mind for me about allyship and supporting LGBTQ plus Christians. So I'm going to like, just like ditto so much of what August said, specifically the fact that to be an ally, it's it's not a noun. It's not like a person, place or thing. It's a verb. It's what you do. So 
it's it has to be active. It has to be an active act of working in allegiance with the queer community. So it's super important that you keep that in the front of your mind, that it can't just be like this quiet thing that you don't talk about. You have to be willing to put yourself out there and defend the rights of the LGBTQ community. And I think one of the one of the easiest ways that you can do it is to get really comfortable confronting people when when it's safe. I'm not saying like you should just go up to strangers that are like, I don't know, being homophobic in the mall or something, but it's really helpful when you know someone personally, you work with someone, you are, have a casual relationship with someone of just, if they say something that's homophobic, challenge it a little bit. Say, yeah, why do you think that? Like, do you think that's actually okay to say? And I would say, get kind of comfortable understanding like just the basics of what they're gonna come at you with and how you should respond to that. So you're gonna hear a lot of like, oh, Sodom and Gomorrah, like be comfortable saying, well, actually the Bible says that the sin of your sister Sodom is that, you know, you're not being loving. Um, and be comfortable saying like, you know, Jesus didn't really say anything. If we're talking about New Testament, like you're talking about like disciples, but Jesus was just talking about love. So where are you, where are you getting this idea that it's okay to hate? Cause I'm pretty sure Jesus definitely didn't say it's okay to hate people. Um, so get comfortable kind of confronting people especially people that you know, because if you know someone that's being homophobic, you are the best person to talk to that person because they're not just going to listen to anyone off the street. They're going to listen to you, the some, you know, a person that they know. And I would also say, do your best to see queer people and queer families as totally normal and embrace the differences of other people. I, I think I've been reflecting that reflecting on that a lot this past week. Um, I, my wife and I, we went and saw the new Disney movie Lightyear. And I was just, I was like, this was a really fun movie. And it's so sad because people are like, we cannot allow our children to watch two old ladies kiss for 30 seconds. Like not even 30 seconds, two seconds. It's literally two milliseconds of a kiss. And it's this idea that there's something wrong and harmful about queer people. And that's just so sad. So normalize it. Be like, oh, that's totally normal. That's just two people that love each other. Cool. Next. Move on. And I think when you're able to normalize and see everyone as equal, like you're going to make the world a far better place, especially for queer Christians. I mean, honestly, there's so little I could add to either of what you say, what you said. Um, I'm just thinking about how for me, some of the most important parts of my journey came from, or the most impactful parts of my journey were because there were people who were not LGBTQ plus themselves, but were willing to over and over again signal that they were safe, that they cared, that they were affirming, and that I, I, they could be trusted with, with my experience in ways that so many others could not be, that they could be trusted with my questions in ways others could not be. So especially if you're trying to, to aspire, to, we, we use the term like aspire towards allyship because you know allyship is to what Erica said, it's a verb, it's, an, it's, a, it's a way of being, a mentality. Um, you, we're always aspiring towards it. All of us are aspiring, should be aspiring towards allyship with one another in so many different ways, not just, you know, being LGBTQ plus, um, there are many ways to experience and aspire towards allyship. But my point is, uh, there are ways in which we we need as LGBTQ plus people, we need that kind of relational safety, um, whether it's providing resources, whether it's providing space, relationship. Um, sometimes you can you can have a real significant impact on an LGBTQ plus young person's life just because you're willing to um, create that safe, affirming, um, holy space. And so there's really, like I said, nothing I can truly add to what my, uh, my friends and colleagues here have said already, but, um, I, I think that's it. I don't have any other questions. Did either of you have any closing final thoughts? Cool. 
I, I actually have one, one little tiny thing. And I, I say it because Nathaniel, you were talking about how it took you to get to the point where you were like, pride is not this like negative thing. Um, there's a, there's a song called proud and it's by Heather Smalls. And the chorus is like, what have you done today to make you feel proud? And it's like, this thing that I think about a lot when it's like the month of like, when it's, when it's Pride Month, I think, what have I done lately to like make me proud of myself? And it's always when I'm doing things that are like acts of love, when I'm doing what Christ wants us to do, when I'm being particularly like loving and caring for like the people in my community, for strangers, for whoever, for the world as a whole, that's what I'm proud of myself. And I think that's kind of what it comes down to when it's when it's pride. It's like, are you are you doing things that, you know, would make would make Christ like happy that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing? Like, yeah. And I I definitely don't have this negative this negative connotation regarding pride because I'm like it's it's for me it's an extension of doing what we should as Christians as LGBTQ Christians as just you know, straight Christians that are allies, just what we're supposed to be doing for one another. So that's how I wrap up the whole idea of pride. <laughs> and if that's all, um, you know, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, you know, definitely stay plugged into QCF, especially our social media, our newsletters, um, lots of ways to connect with us and stay engaged and we love all of you. We hope to see you soon and have a great night.